then and people must have a law. And God established the law, a law of, uh, that to live by, a code of laws to live by. And God not only established a covenant with them, he established a constitution with them of sorts, the law. And they spent one year in Sinai uh, while God spoke to Moses, approximately one year, while God was transmitting to Moses and through Moses the law to the people. And he established, they camped a year there. They not only received the law, but they began implementing the law into their lives before they began, before God moved them forward as a nation. He wanted them operating by the law. Now the law dealt with many things from corporal punishment, as we have already studied, uh, how to worship God. It dealt with the, um, the priesthood and how the priesthood were, was to sacrifice, what was to be done, how it was to be done, how they were to worship. But the law also went on to deal with even the finer details of life. And God um, telling his people the difference between clean and unclean animals, clean and unclean food. And some of that seems to be what the term I would use, picayune, why would God say you can eat this, you can't eat that? But not until recently, in fact, um, very recently in our history, did we even discover the presence of germs. Uh, you, you watch and read of some of the habits in the Civil War uh, during which they were performing operations as they were operating on the wounded individuals and, and amputating legs. And the lack of hygiene was incredible because they didn't know anything about germs. It's difficult for us to believe that, but so many died from infection and they couldn't figure out what infection was. I mean, very often the surgeon would, would cut one person, um, I don't want to get too graphic here, but uh, the, work on one individual and then wipe the knife off on his pants and start on the next one. They didn't simply didn't have any knowledge of that. To that, to us, that seems incredible. But God wisely did know about germs. We did not know until recently that there were parasites that could be acquired through ham. And I don't know if you know that or not. Improperly cooked ham, you can, you can, you can be infested with parasites. Even today, you can't eat raw ham. I, I, and, and the parasites actually get into your muscles. God knew about that. And he knew that they didn't have ovens like we have today. They cooked with fire. And God knew there was a danger that his people would become sick from eating ham. So pigs became unclean. It wasn't because God just said, I don't like pigs. I created them but never have liked those things. You know, it, it was because God saw that it would be unhealthy for his people. The Jewish people were some of the first in the world to establish washing with flowing water. Well, that's to wash with flowing water takes germs off much better than to wash in a pan or a basin with just water that other people have washed their hands in. To us, that makes sense. That was revolutionary back then. And they, the people saw that as a religious exercise. But in reality, there was a reason behind it. Our God is a very smart God, in case you didn't know. And what he sets down is for our good. So he established the law with them. And then lastly, after they were ready, he said, all right, it's time to go into the land that I have promised you, the land of Canaan. He had promised that 400 years earlier in Genesis, the 17th chapter, verse 8 to Abram. And, and he said that he would, he would uh, the whole land of Canaan, where you are now an alien, I will give as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you. Notice that in Genesis, the 17th chapter, verse 8, it is established that Israel will inherit a land forever. It says an everlasting possession. That's what the battle is over today. Who owns the land? That was decided in Genesis 17. And by the way, Israel had possession of the land way before there was any people group called Palestinians. And so, so the, it's a moot point. It doesn't even make any sense. And I think I remember sharing with you last week that the United Nations at their annual meeting, 194 nations, voted the very first resolution that was, that was put forth by the Palestinians 
and was voted on was that, the Isra that Israel has to leave the land, including eastern Jerusalem and the western wall portion, in one year. That they have to leave their land. So they're still trying to get Israel out of the land that God gave to them in Genesis 17:8. And only 14 nations voted no, which should be very alarming to us. Never in the history of the world have we, we've seen anti-Semitism. We've always seen it. But it's been isolated anti-Semitism. Now we're seeing anti-Semitism um, reflected and conveyed and communicated around the world. When 180 nations of the world will vote against the Jewish people, we have never in history seen that level of anti-Semitism. Which, by the way, is another glaring evidence that we are in the last of the last days. That we are in that time the Bible speaks of. Such as we're seeing things that the world has never seen. So people say, well, they've been saying Jesus is going to come ever since I was a kid. And they've been saying this, been saying, we've never seen what we're seeing today. I may touch a little bit on it in, in the message. Now, what happened is then that, that as they went to enter the land and the spies went in and you know the story, the 12 spies went in, 10 came out, said we can't do it, shouldn't do it. Two said we can do it. God called that rebellion. Now, remember that when the 10 spies came back, we call that fear. They didn't call that fear. They called that wisdom. If, if people came back and said, look, we went in and they've got five nuclear weapons and we have none. And they've got this and they've got that. And you brought that to a nation and the nation said, those people, they didn't call those people cowards. They called them wise. And fear often, this is another, another message. I won't get off on the branch, but fear often disguises itself as wisdom. Fear often disguises itself as wisdom when the bottom line is we're afraid and we're not going to follow God. And that's what happened. Joshua and Caleb, let's go in and get them. He said they are food for us. Think about that. Joshua, the others are saying we look like grasshoppers in their eyes and in our eyes too. Notice that wording. In our own eyes, we look like grasshoppers. That's fear and in their eyes too, and Joshua and Caleb said, nonsense, they're bread for us. They're meat for us. Finding sustenance in the middle of the battle is a key to living a victorious life as a Christian. How do I find victory and food in the middle of the battle? Well, when you are following God and you're walking in faith, he will make the circumstances of your battle to feed you if you're in the right place at the right time. And in Israel's case, if they'd have gone in, they'd have won the victory. But as it was, God said, all right, 40 years, this generation will pass away before I lead you in. I'm not going to allow you to go in because you've been unfaithful and you've rebelled. You know, I can just see Joshua and Caleb. You know, these guys are old. By the time, I don't know who the last person was, but I can just about see them standing by their bedside saying, <laughs> right? <laughs> Maybe the person's fighting for their life and they're saying, get it over with. We want to go in. Right? And that next generation went in. However, it took five to seven years of battle. It's a, a lot of teaching here. God did not take them directly in, but he took them a roundabout way to teach them how to war. There's so many applicable truths to our own lives today that God, when he's leading us, when we're a new Christian, when we're cutting our teeth, when we're beginning to mature, God will not allow you to go into battles. He will not allow you to be tempted above that which you are able. He will not allow you to go into battles that are too much for you. He will expose you to, to battle slowly so you learn how the weapons of our warfare are mighty to the pulling down of strongholds. And so God will let you learn how, let us learn how to use the weapons that he has given us before he exposes us to a huge battle. Okay. Get this thing to, got to be smarter than the board. All right. We're going to move quickly here. Now we're going to get into the division the division of the books. And we're not going to stay long here because we don't want to 
Um, and by the way, that concluded the, the formation period of Israel. When they entered the, the promised land, the land of Canaan, that concluded the formation point, part. All right, let's talk about the division of the books before we get a little deeper and the order of the Old Testament books. First of all, we have the Pentateuch, which is the Greek word from the Greek word, and it means five scrolls. Remember, the Bible was not written like this. It was written on scrolls. And if you go into a Jewish synagogue even today, or over in Israel, when we were in Israel, there was a bar mitzvah taking place, and they were dancing in the streets, and the 12-year-old boy was carrying one of the scrolls, and they're that big. And he was carrying the scroll. He had the honor of carrying the scroll, and they were, they were making music and beating. I mean, they actually stopped traffic to get over to the Western Wall. And we had to wait on them as they went and danced and went over to the Western Wall and made a big deal. So it was on scrolls, the five scrolls. And that's the Greek meaning for Pentateuch. It is what we call the law. It is what um, uh, Israel, the Jewish, belief, the Jewish uh, people call the Torah, the five books, the Torah. And it, it is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And all of those names... I guess I will. We may not make it through today, but I, while I'm teaching, the names are indicative of what is in the book. Genesis means the book Genesis. I don't have it up here, but Genesis means origin or beginning. That's what the book Genesis. We know that it's the Genesis of something. We'll even use that phrase. Um, let's see. Uh, Exodus. Well, that exit. There's the exit. Exodus, departure, leaving. So Exodus is covering the departure of the Jews from Egypt. Um, let's see if I wrote it down here. By the way, Moses wrote the five books of the law. Even though his death is recorded in Deuteronomy, someone else recorded his death. He wrote the five books. Numbers, of course, you say, what's that have? To? Numbers, the census of Israel was taken twice in the book of Numbers. So that's why it's called Numbers. It has more than senses in it. Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy, do, dudo, Ronomy, dudo is twice, twice the law. And it's where Moses goes back, back and revisits the points of the law, how to worship. He goes back through that again for a new generation that had not been there in the original giving of the law. So two times, two times law is what Deuteronomy means. So we have the Pentateuch, the law. We have the historical books, Joshua through Esther. We have the prophets. We have the major prophets and the minor prophets. Who can tell me the difference between the major and minor? Why are they, why are they called major and minor? It's not because these guys had really something important to say. And these kind of had something but it was kind of minor it's the length of the book these are longer books so they're called major prophets these guys were windier than these guys Isaiah Jeremiah Lamentations Ezekiel and Daniel the major prophets the, the minor prophets are Hosea Joel Amos Obadiah Jonah Micah Nahum Habakkuk Zephaniah Haggai Zechariah and Malachi the minor prophets. Did you get that down? Did you write that? <laughs> My mother, by the way, was a trained secretary and knew shorthand. Have you ever seen shorthand? Yes. And she could, she could write uh, 80 to 100 words per minute. We found the certificate in, by the way, some of her things after she passed away. And she could write 80 to 100 words per minute as a, as a secretary in that shorthand. And it just looks like You'd never know what it is. It's really cool. And she could type that fast, too. We had an old manual typewriter. And man, my mother could look at, I remember as a boy in, a, in school, she could look at that and ching, ching. It was pretty impressive. <clears throat> and then we have the wisdom literature, the poetic and, and the wisdom literature. That's Psalms, Proverbs, Job, and Ecclesiastes. Now, we call these the poetic but they contain, they, these two are called wisdom literature. Um, 
And these books should not be discounted because they contain history. They also, of course, contain songs. Psalms were songs, okay? But they also are inspired because they contain prophecy. The, the Psalms and, and even um, others contain uh, prophecies that were fulfilled by Jesus as Messiah. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That was Psalms. He was quoting Psalms when he was on the cross. So inspired, but which, which book in the Bible is the oldest? Job. Job, Job was the, is the oldest, the first book written. All right, New Testament quotes from all three categories. Now I must say that my Jewish friends disregard, discard. They do, but that's not the way to spell that. Discard. Actually, they disregard. My Jewish friends disregard um, as non-binding upon their lives anything that's outside of the five scrolls. Anything that's outside of the Torah. So in an argument for life, in an argument where perhaps I would use Psalm 139, all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. You saw me when I was being created in the, in the unseen place. And when they use that as a reason to protect life prior to birth, they discount that because it's not in the law. And that's, that's in the writings, the writings. And so, uh, just a little, little information for you there. All right, we are at 10.03, and I've got, I'm going to take a couple of minutes here. And I'm going to talk about, if I may, and by the way, the, so I'm, I'm going to speak very quickly, the transmission of the text, how do we know that it's accurate? So let's talk for just a few moments about the way the scribes would copy a scroll. How can we ensure that what we have before us is the Word of God? We talked about that a little bit later in the fact that we have the Dead Sea Scrolls that were discovered in 1947. About 190 scrolls were found in 11 caves, the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, 20 of Genesis, 14 of Exodus, 27 of Deuteronomy, 34 of the Book of Psalms, between 20 and 24 of Isaiah. Um, some of these have some Paleo-Hebrew script, um, but those are all original scrolls, 190 scrolls, and they were older by a thousand years than the oldest known manuscript in museums prior to their discovery. And yet they're almost identical to any printed Hebrew Bible you could have bought in a shop prior to that, which was a tremendous discovery confirming that what they have been studying is identical and is accurate. Um, the Dead Sea Scrolls, like I said, include the whole book of Isaiah and parts of every Old Testament book except Esther. So that's, that's tremendous. But let's talk about the scribes. What did they do? They went to extreme lengths to preserve the integrity of the text. First of all, you have to understand that to a scribe, they were, and you remember that Jesus spoke to the scribes and the scribes interacted with him often. They knew the scriptures because that's what they did every day, all day, was copy the scriptures. They were completely convinced in their mind that it was the Word of God. They had tremendous respect and reverence for the Word of God. And they knew that what they were being called to do was incredibly important, to transfer the Word of God to a new scroll. And so they knew that they were under obligation to make no deliberate changes or they would come under the judgment of God. So step no, think, item number one, you have to remember, the scribes literally were very, they were very um, honored. It was a very honored task, but they were also, um, they lived under the fear of God because they knew they were copying the word, the literal word of God. But then, so how do we know that there were not accidental um, changes or accidental uh, changes from the original? 
Here's how we know. They counted, for example, the number of times each letter of the alphabet occurs in each book. They pointed out the middle letter of the Pentateuch and the middle letter of the entire Hebrew Bible. So can you imagine going through the whole of the Torah, the Old Testament, or the, the books of the law, counting the number of letters, and then taking your new handwritten copy and, cop and counting all over again to see if you had missed one letter, not one word, one letter. Counting all the letters, every letter, twice through the entirety of five books to make sure that you hadn't missed something. Now, if they did have, if there was a variant, if they found something, they did not rewrite the whole scroll, but they made a note in the margin of the mistake. Because as I said, these scrolls, so they didn't rewrite the whole scroll, they made a note. But that's how we know that we have actually the, the original. It's one way that we're sure that they be, of that the transfer down through the centuries was accurate. All right, well, the Bible is, the Old Testament is still relevant for today and actually is still being applied for today. I'll be speaking today, maybe I'll touch on, on Daniel, the 12th chapter, verse 4, where Daniel 12, 4 says, until the time of the end, he said, God told Daniel, seal up this book. So Daniel's in the Old Testament. But the book was sealed until the time of the end, which is where we're living. It's, God told Daniel, many shall run to and fro. What that means is when you dig into it, it means that, that that speed of transportation will increase. People will be going everywhere. You think? I mean, it, we have seen today, you know, we, man rode through animal transportation for centuries and centuries and centuries and centuries until the invention of the combustion gas engine. And now look at this. And now look at planes. And now look, you know, astronauts. It's incredible the way we move and the speed we move. And he said, at the end, many will run to and fro and knowledge shall increase. Knowledge shall increase. That is an Old Testament book that is being fulfilled right now. I, again, I may cover this in the message this morning, but AI, how many of you know what AI is? AI, want me to scare you? Well, the guy that invented AI has repented for inventing it and resigned. And now he's fighting against Google because he knows the danger of it. AI thinks 100,000 times faster than a human being. AI thinks 100,000 times faster than you already. And did you see just last night, I saw that Ray-Ban has new glasses. Have you seen these new glasses? Saw them advertising them last night. And you can speak into your glasses and it has cameras right here. And you can ask AI a question about what you're looking at. And AI can see it through that camera. Ladies and gentlemen, we are entering the la we are in the last of the last days. How will the Antichrist rule the world? How will he keep track of everyone? There's that, is that the person AI? Is that the person right there in the grocery line? Everywhere. Everywhere. We've never had this ability until today. We are right there. We're at, the, we're at the end of the end. Jesus could come at any time. Don't act so happy. <laughs> Even so come. Even so come, Lord Jesus. All right. I'm trying to keep this from being boring. Is the Old Testament boring? Okay, good. Good. God bless you. Have a great service.